Open up your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2, we're going to be in verses 8 through 17 this morning of Revelation chapter 2. We're going to be looking at two messages to two different churches this morning, Smyrna and Pergamum. Smyrna is the shortest and most straightforward of all of the letters or messages that were sent to the churches. Uh, not really even a lot to be explained in that letter. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, but then you come to Pergamum, which is almost twice as long and easily has twice as many difficult things to apply. So let's see if I can balance this out by giving the appropriate amount of time for Pergamum without also shortchanging Smyrna at the same time. So we're going to begin with an introduction to Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life, says this. So first let's talk about the city of Smyrna. Smyrna, in many ways, competed with Ephesus for the title of the foremost city of Asia Minor. They had the superior port, while Ephesus had the superior network of roads. Uh, both cities prided themselves on worship of the em emperor. Smyrna may have led the way in the worship to Caesar, uh, something that was a great boast to the citizens of that city. And also, based on what we know in this specific letter and also church history, Smyrna also boasted a Jewish population that was both passionate for Judaism and also passionate for their hatred of Christianity. And the Christians paid dearly because of that Jewish population, as we're going to see right now in verses 9 and 10. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. The difficulty for the church of Smyrna is seen through two words that describe their state, tribulation and poverty. Now, tribulation is the standard word for affliction. It will be the word that we use when we speak of the great tribulation that is yet to come. But this is just a word that means that someone is, is afflicted, that they're persecuted. And to understand the depth of their affliction, I think that we see that from the use of the word poverty that immediately follows it. So to see the depth of what they're going through, you need to understand what this word, what this word poverty means. Because there are two words for poverty in the Roman world. One is the standard word for poor. The other is a word that means penniless. It means having nothing. And the one that Christ used is the one that means having nothing. This is not just any poverty. This is extreme poverty. This is total, abject poverty. Why? Why did they have such tribulation that it was turning them to such an impoverished state? Well, they were being persecuted. They were being attacked. Uh, we see that it is on a count of blasphemy. Now, pretty much any group in Smyrna could probably accuse the Christians in that city of blasphemy. Simply refusing to say Caesar is Lord uh, could get you imprisoned and persecuted for your faith in Jesus Christ. And that would be held as blasphemy. Also, the Jews would accuse any Christians of blasphemy for their worship of Jesus Christ, for saying, Jesus is Lord. So I see the blasphemy that's brought up here as the most common accusation that would be heaped upon the church by both the Jews and the Romans who were living in Smyrna. And I think a lot of the lead of this, as we see, is from the Jews. The Jews who are described as part of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, that is not the Orthodox community that I would want to be up against, the synagogue of Satan. And to know the type of persecution that was coming out of that church, we simply need to learn about the martyrdom, the death of Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp, one of the earliest church fathers, was martyred in the city of Smyrna. He was burned to death by the Jews of the city. And they were so passionate to kill Polycarp that they gathered the wood to burn him to death on 
the Sabbath. Think about how much they must have hated the church to do that work and labor to bring the wood together on the Sabbath. They were so hateful of Christianity that they were willing to break their own law and their own tradition in order to brutally murder Christians. And Christ here also speaks of a 10-day tribulation period for them. And there's been a lot of speculation as far as what that 10-day period would mean or is pointing to. But looking at various persecutions throughout Roman history, I think it's most likely that this 10-day persecution just referred to a 10-day period of persecution, something connected with a festival or some Roman games that were being held in the city. So this was a prophecy from Jesus Christ that at some period in the upcoming days, they would experience abnormally harsh persecution. They would be rounding up Christians and throwing them in jail by lot, but the Lord is letting them know it will only occur for a period of 10 days. Uh, that, is, that is comfort to them to know that if they come through it, uh, that God delivered them and that God saw it there and, and he brought them through it all. And also a confidence that, that God knows the future, that Jesus knows what is coming upon his people. It points to the omniscience of the one who's writing this letter. And before they enter this period of persecution, Jesus encourages them with his ending message in verses 10 and 11. Be faithful unto death, Jesus writes, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. So we have two encouragements here for the church of Smyrna, one based on reward and one based on the victory of Jesus Christ. First, we have the reward one that if they are faithful unto death, if they, if they are martyred, on account of Jesus Christ, he will give them a crown of life on account of their faithfulness all the way to death. They'll receive a special crown, a special reward for being martyred for the faith. But I think the key to understanding all of this section of encouragement is to see that as the crown of life is, uh, this is all about things that come to with eternity, as well as the blessing that they won't be hurt by the second death. Uh, this is all about what's going to happen for these Christians after they die and leave the world. Be faithful to death. Why? You'll receive a crown of life. The overcomer is significant. Why? Because the overcomer will not be hurt by the second death. You see, for the Christians in Smyrna, in this life, there were going to be no crowns. There was going to be no favor from the local political rulers. There will be no wealth that is coming into their household. If they're going to be looking for crowns and protection and riches, they got to look toward eternity and toward what Christ will bring after their death. And Jesus is letting them know that, that no matter how painful it is today, and even if it's painful until the very day that you die, it will all be worth it. In the end, if you're a martyr, you will receive the crown of life. If someone you loved is killed on account of their faith, e even that pain, that anguish that you're going through in your heart, Jesus will reward even that. And this is also one of those places where I just can't imagine the title overcomer being based upon our efforts and our good works and our faithfulness. Because if you think about it, how empty of a promise would it be for the promise to be you will not be hurt at the second death if you are faithful to the very end? You see, to me, that's not a promise. That's, that's a threat. It's a threat that if some persecution comes upon you that, that you can't endure, that brings fear out of you that you never knew was possible, and you deny Jesus at the end, He's going to cast you out under those circumstances? You, you, you were faithful, but then you failed at the end, and, and no more, he's going to kill you at the second death? That's not a promise, that's a threat. You better continue to speak the name of Christ, or he's sending you to hell. Oh, no, 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 my friend. This is an encouragement. This is not a threat. This is not telling them that unless they will persevere, it will all be in vain. But this is an encouragement to let them know that because Christ has overcome, 
And because they are in Christ, and they have overcome through faith in Christ, that no matter what they face in this world, no matter how they stumble and fall, they will be secure in Christ to the very end. They are secure because they have placed their faith in Jesus, and He provides them that place of security. I believe we all should strive to be faithful just like the Christians in Smyrna. But we don't strive to be faithful out of fear that we might one day be thrown in hell. Instead, we thrive to be faithful from a place of confidence, knowing that greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. We strive from a confidence of knowing where our eternal destiny will be. And that's an assurance that I believe brings the greatest confidence and strength to the Christian to continue to testify of the word of Jesus Christ. And now let's transition from Smyrna on to Pergamum. Let's begin with the introduction to their letter in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. So let's begin by talking about the city Pergamum. Uh, Pergamum did not have the ideal trade locations of an Ephesus or a Smyrna, but it had two other things that was going for it that allowed it to be highly influential, and I think those led to the struggles that the Christians experienced in that city. First, Pergamum was the Roman capital of that region, so the region of Asia Minor, Pergamum was the, the Roman capital of that area. Uh, so while they weren't wealthy in trade, they were wealthy because of political connections, which also then led to Pergamum being a, a central location for emperor worship, even more so than Smyrna was. Pergamum boasted three temples to the emperor. Uh, second, Pergamum has sort of a, a, an interesting geographical uh, hill shape uh, that allowed, that made people say, you know what, the city of Pergamum is an ideal place to worship the gods, because it was like the whole city was a high place. And if you remember from the Old Testament, where did uh, the people of the ancient Near East love to worship their gods? It was on the high place places. And so Pergamum was just this sort of natural because of its ge geography, a, a place that people would want to go and worship the gods. And so that made it a center for pagan worship. They had three temples to Caesar, but then they had hundreds of temples to other gods. So if you wanted to be part of the society of Pergamum, you either needed to be in politics or religion. And those two blended in ways that would probably surprise us just how much they blended. And it also explains the sin issue that was going on with this church. And as a side bonus, uh, this is not going to help you at all probably understand Pergamum, but I find it interesting. Uh, Pergamum also boasted what may have been the most expansive library in the world at that time period. It may have been even larger than the Library of Alexandria, uh, so much to the point that uh, parchment, the, the paper material that they wrote on during that time period, uh, the name parchment actually comes from the root Pergamum. It's things that they wrote on in Pergamum. So uh, the word parchment comes from that city. So with that introduction, let's look at the body of the letter to see the character of the Christians in Pergamum. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept Balak, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against you with the sword of my mouth. 
First, the, the praise for Pergamum start, starts out well. It starts out just as well as Smyrna, really. Uh, they are holding fast to the name of Jesus Christ, so they aren't denying Jesus' name. They're trusting in Him. Uh, they have their faithfulness that, that is highlighted uh, in the midst of the extreme idolatry of Pergamum. They are continuing to glorify Christ right with an area that is so full of idolatry that uh, Jesus can say Satan's throne dwells there. But when it came to their economic lifestyle, they more took the idea of, hey, a brother's got to make a living. Uh, uh, am I right? And when you're, knee deep, knee, when you're neck deep in idolatry and emperor worship, in order to make a living, well, you got to do what you, you got to do. And sometimes what you got to do is you got to go and sleep with the local prostitutes in the temple in order to be a good citizen for your city and uh, worship them and, and call on the rain to fall down. Sometimes you got to say Caesar is Lord so you can be involved in the political circles. So you got to get involved with all of that. If they're going to have their, their feast at the temple where they're going to be coming together and eating all that meat that's been sacrificed to the idols and all of their pagan worship and, and you want to make connections in that religious and political world, you're going to have to be there at the feast. So they were Christians who were, who were faithful to Jesus Christ in, in word and when, when they gathered together, but, but then when they, they lived in the midst of their neighbors and those who were around us, them, then they acted like the world. And while for us, the idea of going into temple prostitutes uh, just sounds totally sinful, and, and how could somebody possibly do something like that and believe they were being faithful at the same time, we need to remember that when you're in a city where you're being raised and you're told from the age that you're five, you know what? If we ever have a time where our city goes through a drought and you need to end that drought, well, a way to do that is to call on the favor of God's, but by going to the local temple, giving a little coin, sleeping with those prostitutes, getting the favor of the God by giving the money, and that also made them happy when you slept with those prostitutes. And so you do that, and then you get the God's favor, and then he would bring down rain. You're told from childhood, that's how the world works. That's how you bless your city. So all of the sudden, when you become a Christian, you don't initially think those things are wrong. In your mind, you're still thinking those behaviors are patriotic. They're, they, they're what I need to do to help my city be prosperous. And if you stop doing them, then your neighbors are going to be like, what, what, you, you don't care about Pergamon anymore? Now, now that you're a Christian, you're, you're not even going to go and pray to the gods and and get their support because we're going through a tough time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now that you're saying Jesus is Lord, you won't also say Caesar is Lord? You know how important it is we stay on Caesar's good graces? And so it's easier to just go along to get along. To be one way when you're at church and worship. One way if you're, you're actively spreading the gospel to someone else but then you're an entirely different person when it comes to the economic parts of your life. And I think we can all do that. We can all be very inconsistent people, and that's how they were in Pergamum. And this is a reminder to be consistent, to be the same type of person while we're here in church that we're out in the world, that we'll treat people at the grocery store, at Target or Walmart or wherever else you're shopping, the same way you treat people while you're here. The people in your workplace will think the same as you as the people in the church. We need to be consistent. The second sin that they also had in the city of Pergamum was, we read, so you also have some who in some way, the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we already talked about the Nicolaitans before in the previous lesson. We remember that they were some type of, of Gnostic group. It uh, doesn't really help us much because there's a wide variety of what Gnostics are. They just believe they're secret language. It's only for the secret knowledge, excuse me, that's only for the elect individuals. And so we don't know specifically how they were holding to the, to the Nicolaitans, but in some way they had welcomed some of their practices into their midst. Now, the warning is, to this church now is a call to repent. 
Now, repentance just simply means a change of mind. It means turning. It means for the Christians in Pergamum, they have to realize that their current pattern and lifestyle, the way they've been going, is sinful, and they have to turn from it. And the warning is, if they don't repent, Jesus says, I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, now notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say, I'm going to make war against you, but I'm going to make war against them. And so the question is, do you want to be living embedded with the culture that Jesus is going to make war with? And if you think about someone in the Bible who lived embedded with a people who Jesus, God, had to make war with, our example in the Bible, the foremost one, is Lot. Do you want to be like Lot sitting in the gates of Sodom? With the fires of heaven about to rain down? That's the warning Jesus is bringing upon the Christians in Smyrna. So let's come out from among them. Let's live a lifestyle that is distinct and Christian. And then we have the final encouragement to them, and that is the encouragement in verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on that stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So this is a tough one. There's a couple of phrases in here that are a little difficult to know what they mean. Uh, Here they are promised the hidden manna as well as a white stone with their name on it. A lot of theories about both of those. Uh, First, kind of go over the hidden manna. Probably the most interesting theory about this one is that there's a legend that Jeremiah had taken bread and hid it in the temple right before its destruction at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And this hidden manna is the bread that Jeremiah hid in the temple. Don't know how that can relate to Pergamum, but seems odd, but it's out there. Um, So some tie it to the manna. Uh, There's also a Jewish legend that when the manna fell in the wilderness, that white stones were sprinkled along with the manna. Not sure why God would do that. Sounds like you'd be tricking the person to possibly eat stones instead of the manna. So it doesn't seem like the best idea, but it's it's out there. So some tie the manna, uh, the hidden manna, to the white stone, to that old Jewish legend. Uh, Some also look at the white stones as the stones that were on the breastplate of the high priest. And so this has the idea that we're going to have stones with our new name on it in the center of our attire in glory. And i got to say, there are enough theories about most of these that I'm going to say we can't know for sure the significance of either of them. So I'm just going to give my best theory and understand this is Sean's best theory. Is Sean probably right? Probably not, but he's doing uh, his best out of the list. So uh, let's think about what these could mean. So I think what Jesus is doing here is giving them two forms of encouragement, uh, one for today and one for eternity. Uh, The encouragement for today relates to the manna. I think Jesus is telling them that he will provide for them no matter what happens. Manna was all about daily provisions for the Israelites in the wilderness. The Israelites just had enough for today. If it was the day before Sabbath, they'd have enough just for for two days, and then they wouldn't need to come back the next day uh, for more manna. God was giving just enough, and, and they couldn't do anything to prepare for it. They couldn't see how it was coming. It was just there. So I think Jesus is telling the Christians in Pergamum, I can meet people's needs. Like, I got, I got, a, I got a history of doing this. God could be saying to people in Pergamum, I got a name. It's a lot older than you guys. People call me Jehovah Jireh. I can provide. So it's a reminder of the provision of the Lord so that the Christians of Pergamum didn't think that they needed to continue to be involved in these pagan practices in order to make a living. So it's pointing to God's daily provision. And then we have the white stone. Uh, and this one is just hard. I uh, don't know what significance we should attach to the white stone at all. Uh, I just simply see it as a place to have the name engraved on it. And I think it's going to be a very special thing 
when we all receive a name from Jesus. Now, in the passage, it says, a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Now, in my opinion, I, I don't think that that means that we're never going to share that name with anyone else, that for all eternity, we're just going to have a special name between you and Jesus. But I think this is the idea that Jesus isn't going to get a collection of people together and they're going to have a powwow and then decide what to name you. But Jesus has a name that he knows why it's significant to you. And, and you know why it's significant from him. And, and it's something special between the two of you, but I think it's going to spread among everybody. And everybody's going to be calling you by that new name. And the reason I say that is because Jesus had a pattern of renaming the disciples. And it was something that we all still know about today. Simon became Peter, Levi became Andrew. We had James and John, the sons of thunder. And I believe he will do the same as us. We'll get a new glorious name. So here at our church, I am known as Sean. But when I meet to work out, with my brothers in F3 Nation, I'm known as Rev Sox. And everybody in F3, when you finish your first workout, you receive a complimentary nickname. A nickname that is something that we can think about, think up on the spot from either something foolish you did during the workout or when you tell us what you do for a living or how many kids you have or where you come from, <clears throat> we give you a name based on that. So since I've started being pastor here a few years ago, uh, the people in our church who have visited that are F3 members, uh, they have the following nicknames. Here at church, we've had Hog Sickle, Darkwing Duck, Channel Mullet, War Eagle, Cyber Cajun, The Reluctant Yankee, Walleye, um, and a few more, some that probably might not even be appropriate for me to say up here this morning, but F3 gives out these names because it is the fastest way for a man to feel included, to be part of the in-group. Uh, the theme song of Cheers was, this is the place where everybody knows your name. And F3 discovered we'd have even better community if we didn't just know your name, but we gave it to you. So being given a new name by Jesus, it's a very special thing. It provides an in-group feeling. It provides a special connection between Jesus and the person that he named. I mean, what would it have meant to Simon to all of a sudden be known as Peter when he's in Jesus, with Jesus' presence? Or for James and John to be known as the thun sons of thunder? And so Jesus gives this name to bring community amongst his disciples, and he will do the same for us and I think this is important for the, for the Christians of Pergamum because if they begin to really live like Christians, they're going to kind of be outcasts in their own city. Well, it's okay if you're an outcast in your own city if you have a heavenly city with a new name that you're looking forward to in glory. So this is letting the Christians of Pergamum know that even if they are cast out of their own city temporarily for eternity, they will be included with Christ and his people with a greater depth than they ever could be in their own hometown. So they should prioritize eternity over the temporal. So those are the letters to Smyrna, Smyrna and Pergamum. And I hope we can take some of these lessons to heart that they received. And next we'll cover Thyatira and Sardis in chapter 2, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 6.